Sugar Bowl, which is the game that we will follow for the number one college football show live right here. Please go check out the YouTubes, uh, the Twitters. You can see it, schedule it so you can be here with us as we chop up who's going to play in the national championship game. Okay, number three, Texas versus number two, Washington. Texas is a four and a half point favorite in this one. Over under is uh, 62 and a half. That's the total. This has also got really, really fun storyline. Steve Sarkeesian, a former Washington head coach, lost to Washington the last time he faced uh, head coach, uh, faced them as head coach at Texas. Sarge defensive coordinator, Pete Kwiatkowski, also outstanding defense coordinator for the University of Washington, and built the kind of defense that Washington came to just love over about seven years in there. I mean, it is a defense that took on the nickname of Death Row. And if you go look at what they were doing while Pete Kwiatkowski was there with Jimmy Lake calling the defense, I think even Suge Knight would be like, yeah, UW, got to, they got it like that. They can have it. Yeah, come to Death Row. That means come to Seattle now. Now, at Washington, Kwiatkowski won two Pac-12 titles. Coach UW to the 2016 college football playoffs. So he's also been in this atmosphere before. Coached three All-Americans and the first NFL draft selection and first uh, unanimous All-American in one package in two decades at Washington. Like he knows from defense and you could see that in how the Texas defense has been playing. We'll get to that in a bit. On the other side though, Kalen DeBoer, head coach at Washington. I, I love this man. I love him because I was very early on him as the offensive coordinator at Indiana, and early on him as the head coach at Fresno State. When he became the head coach of Washington, close friends of mine were like, yo, dog, what do I have here in Kalen DeBoer? Why, why don't I like this? And these are Washington fans. I'm going, that's a good football coach. You're, you're going to like him. He knows how to win football games. You take a look at his record. Many people thought that Kalen DeBoer was a step down for Washington, not a step up. My goodness, has it proved to be the opposite. Not only is this man outstanding, but we're talking about 13-0 in the most difficult Pac-12 we have seen in at least a decade. 13-0 for a Washington team that the last time went 13-0 won a national championship. A Heisman finalist at quarterback. One of the two best wide receivers in the sport out on the numbers for them. Kind of dude that plays with broken ribs. My goodness, Romo Dunzi. And then a man who does not lose football games. Like I had this stat a long time ago, but I'm going to pull it up here now. Washington with our man DeBoer, 24 and two over the last couple of years. That's good. They're riding a 20 game win streak. That's better. That man has won more than 100 games and lost 11. That man in a playoff atmosphere, for which this is, is 17 and two at the NAIA level. Now, I understand this is a larger stage, this is a bigger stage, but I am from the school of are you a winner? Because if you're a winner, it doesn't matter what level you are coaching at. It doesn't matter what sport we're playing. If you're playing Scrabble, if we're bowling, if we're racing, a winner is a winner. It's part of who they are. It's what they do. It's how they get down. And Kalen DeBoer has shown, I'm a winner because I trust my playmakers to make plays in critical moments. And he does that over and over again with guys like Michael Penix Jr. and Romo Dunzi and even Dylan Johnson, who we'll get here in a second. Back to Texas for just a second here, though. I find it interesting that they will go into this playoff game with Arch Manning as the backup quarterback for Quinn Ewers. I find this interesting because I think you could be setting Arch Manning up for a Garrett Gilbert moment. So for you young cats, 2010 BCS National Championship game featured Alabama versus Texas. Colt McCoy, one of the greatest to ever do it at the University of Texas starting quarterback. Marcel Darius hit that man so hard, he pinched a nerve in Colt McCoy's throwing shoulder, took him out for the game. In comes freshman phenom, Texas high school football's own Garrett Gilbert, a top, a top 15 recruit, number two quarterback in his 2009 dra uh, draft class, recruiting class, and the heir apparent to Garrett Gilbert. Comes in, it ain't go well. Not only does Marcel Darius get him too because he picked him off, it ends like this for Gary Gilbert in that game. 15 of 40, 186, two TDs, four interceptions. Now, the epilogue on Gilbert's playing career is he bounced back. He transferred to SMU and even won a Super Bowl as a part of the 2014, or excuse me, 2015 New England Patriots practice squad. Okay, so he's got a ring. But being drafted in the sixth round is not what you want for Arch Manning. Okay, when you were going down, it's not what you want for Arch Manning. 
Now, we could talk about Malik Murphy and his decision to enter the, the transfer portal at another date and why that is important and why we probably need to change the rules given what is going on with Malik Murphy and what's going on with Tate Rodemaker. But fact remains that Steve Sarkeesian is willing to roll the dice on Arch Manning in a college football playoff semifinal atmosphere if for whatever reason Quinn Ewers can't go. And by the way, that's not out of the realm of possibility. Quinn Ewers got his shoulder blown up against Alabama last year. They lost that again. Got his shoulder blown up again because, well, that dude just don't slide when he should slide. Had to have Malik Murphy come in, not just in relief, but to start football games. So Quinn Ewers and being injury prone is a thing now. So you absolutely have to prepare Arch for the opportunity should it arise for him to go in there. It's just one to watch here, especially for a Texas team that wants to win his first national championship since 2005 and may have if Colt McCoy was, you know, healthy against that Alabama team for which is the jumping off point for everything we know about Nick Saban and Alabama and how dominant that program has been since the last 16 years, right? Now, keys to the game I think are interesting here. Number one, Quinn Ewers is a Rorschach test for any college football fan. Let's find out if that man is a first-round draft pick, right, or not. I would like to see him put it together because he went for 452, right, and a bunch of tutties against an Oklahoma State team that really just looked outclassed. But when you see him, there are some throws he makes that you're going, son, what did you see there? And there are other throws he makes like, yeah, all right, that's the five-star right there because the talent is there. The accuracy is there, but – Something about Quinn Ewer says Baker Mayfield to me, which means, yeah, all right, pretty good, probably could win the Heisman, but so inconsistent in his performances that it just gives you the willies. Like, he's not bad enough for him not to be your starter, but you just want him to be a little bit more consistent with his passing and his throws. Now, that could be helped by a really great performance by the Texas defense. Back to Quinn, uh, back to Pete Kwiatkowski for a second here. I think what he has been able to do in developing the defensive backs of that group into what they are is really just not been acknowledged the way it should. Malik Muhammad might be the best secondary player that Texas has right now. And I love Ryan Watts. I'm a huge Ryan Watts fan. But Malik Muhammad is going to have one hell of a challenge against a guy like Rome Odunzi. And Muhammad has, is every bit that dude. Like he could be a first round pick for them. Uh, I mean, an Earl Thomas uh, type for Texas, if he can hold Odunzi in check, but I just don't know, man. Cause Washington is a better passing attack than Oklahoma was. And Oklahoma put a pot knot on Texas head in the cotton bowl. Okay. I think that if Romo Odunzi can do what he's been doing to everybody against Malik Muhammad, it could be a long day for that defense. Now that said, it's not just Malik Muhammad. It is Jaron Thompson. It is Ryan Watson. There's an outstanding Texas front there that we got to talk about. But Texas, as an immovable object, is going to have to be a thing for Texas to win this football game. And they have been up front for the most part. Devondre Sweat, Byron Murphy II, Jalen Ford, all guys that I think are going to be drafted on day one. They're that good. That front seven is allowing just 81 rush yards per game. That's fourth best in the country. Tavondre Sweat, 42 tackles, eight tackles for loss. Uh, Byron Murphy, eight tackles for loss, five sacks. And then Jalen Ford coming off 119 tackles last year, has 91 this year, 10 and a half for loss, two INTs. They're good up front. So you're going to have one hell of a day. And that's before I start talking about my favorite true freshman on defense. It's Anthony Hill, man. That dude has lived up to the billing that I gave him in the summer and that many people who know what five-star means expected from him as a pass rusher. What Harold Perkins was last year is what Anthony Hill is this year. 63 tackles, seven and a half for loss, and five sacks. Now, also in here, I don't expect Washington to be great running the football, but I do expect them to run the football. The reason I don't expect them to be great, though, is Ali Gordon finished this season as the FBS rushing champion, okay? Has an opportunity to make that even larger against AM and in the Texas Bowl. But, he rushed for just 34 yards on 13 carries against that Texas front. That is a man who was putting up 270, 280 on the ground. That is a man who had eight straight 100-yard rushing games, right? That was a dude, and they put the shackles on him, and he couldn't do nothing. Not a zip. Turn Oklahoma State into an offense that did not function. That's outstanding. If you can do that to this Washington uh, offense, yeah, you're probably going to win this game. Now, it's also 
a Texas defense that didn't just do this against Oklahoma State, but against really great running teams in the Big 12. Like Kansas State rushed for 100 yards or more in every game that they had played, except the one they lost to Texas, right? They went for 30 rush yards on 29 rushes against that Texas front, okay? Again, you might be in a position that is about Quinn Ewers, kind of like being at Tuscaloosa, where come all without, come all within. Have we yet to see the mighty Quinn? Like that's that's what's going to be the difference maker for me for Texas. I expect Texas defense to hold up. I expect him to give them an, him an opportunity to go make some plays. But it's a man that's completed 71% of his passes, 21 TDs, 6 INTs this season. I went for 452 against Oklahoma State, beat Bama, who, again, can win the national championship this year, and won his first Big 12 title since 2009, and yet we still don't have a consensus on what Quinn Ewers is or isn't. I hope to find that out or get close to find that out in this game against Washington. Also adding here another storyline for him is if he plays lights out against Washington, wins Texas the national championship, is he coming back to help lead Texas into its first season in the SEC play? I sure as hell hope so, because I like talking about Quinn Ewers playing college football, but you could see why it might be the arch man in experience in 2024 if this goes the way that Texas would want it to go. And that, you know, all of this is me talking about Quinn Ewers before I tell you that dude got weapons out on the numbers and in the backfield. Uh, Xavier Worthy, goodness me, takes the top off the defense. JT Sanders, if Brock Bowers is the best tight end in the country, JT Sanders is the second best tight end in the country, right? He's that good. Adonai Mitchell, another guy that's an outstanding stud. Jordan Whittington, stud. Cedric Baxter, stud. They got dudes to distribute the football to. And Steve Sarkeesian is going to do that window dress and movement that he loves to do. Probably catch some guys out of space. And then Washington, who is a bend, don't break defense, might absolutely be breaking, right? That's how I get to keys for Washington going into this game. First one is offensive. Throw it. Throw it. Throw it. Like, this means you just got to make light brown beef and chuck it. Like, I just, I don't know another way to say this except let Michael Penix Jr. throw it as often as you possibly can to guys like Romo Dunzi, to guys like Jalen McMillan, right? I mean, he's got dudes in Jalen Polk. Like, don't make this overcomplicated, Ryan Grubb, okay? Your playmakers, for the most part, are on the numbers. And you got the best one that, We've seen west of the Mississippi at quarterback, okay? You just make your Heisman finalist that dude. Now, I need to add in here, stats for the stats, folks. We're talking about Aroma Dunes, he's got over 1,400 yards, right? We're talking about Jalen Polk that's got over 1,000 yards. And we got Jalen McMillan, who looks fit and healthy for the first time in months, right? Great tracking the ball and was second-best wide receiver on that team before getting injured, and I think he can play like that against that Texas defense. Now, the Huskies boast the number one passing offense in the country. Again, chuck it. Okay. Ground beef. Chuck it. I talking about 41 plays of 30 yards or more, which is third or uh, yes, third best in the country. So they're explosive too. And they're liable to hit you over the head. If you allow it, it will make them move the ball down the field. And in a shootout, Michael Penix Jr. Just bass Reeves ex- executing a warrant signed by judge Parker, like deadly accurate. I like that guy. If the scoreboard is going up, I might like, I think I like him a little bit. Yes. I like Michael Penix Jr. As the store rises more than I like Quinn Ewers. I think Quinn Ewers is going to make mistakes that Michael Penix Jr. is frankly a little long in the tooth to be making. All right. That is a reference to his age, but also his experience. He has been in tough winning situations all year. Nobody has played a tougher schedule in this playoff than the Washington Huskies. Okay. They've had to learn to win in so many different ways. They learned to win running the football, which is not a thing that I expected Washington to do well in 2023. Offensive line has also done an outstanding job of keeping Michael Penix Jr. upright. 11 sacks allowed all season. Also not a man that holds on to the football, so he's helping himself there too for those folks that believe that quarterback sacks is a quarterback statistic. But they also are getting help from a run game that has been outstanding in the second half of the season. Dylan Johnson went from never having rushed for 100 yards in any game he had played in his entire career to looking like coming straight out of Compton, like 100 yards and running. This dude has had 100 yards or more rushing in four games, 150 yards of rushing or more in two games, and had 250 against USC. And those 150 yards rushing came against top 25 opponents, USC and Oregon. And we all think that Oregon is a great football team, okay? 
Matter of fact, Johnson's putting up 1,100 yards rushing, 14 TDs against, again, one of the toughest schedules that we have seen for any college football playoff team, frankly, in some time, but specifically this year, nobody can char- uh, nobody can say they played a tougher schedule among these four than Washington. Now, Washington's offense is, what I'm saying is, balanced, messed around, and got accidental Thanos because if they can run the ball and they can throw the ball as well as they had been the last couple of years, you could see how Washington could absolutely run away with this uh, Sugar Bowl title and punch a ticket to the college football playoff national championship. Now, that also means that, okay, let me put it this way. Hold the line, you magnificent dog defense of destiny, okay? Because, goodness me, I did not expect to see Oklahoma light at Washington, where it's, hey, defense, please don't screw this up for us. That That's all. Don't screw this up for us. And that's where Washington Huskies fans are. I'm like, hey, dog, I see you. I understand what you mean there. Because defense ain't great, okay? The defense is middle of the road, okay? Talk about top 70 in yards per play allowed. And that's when ZTF hasn't, you know, picked up the ball, run it back against Utah, and then dropped it before going across the goal line. You can't, you can't, you can't, can't do that against Texas. You're going to lose, all right? We got to keep our wits about us here. They got a bunch of dudes that I love, a bunch of dudes that load up the lunch pail and go to work. I don't know that they got a first rounder on that defense. They're good, but I don't know. Maybe we're talking about perhaps Braylon Trice, who's been outstanding for them. He's got eight tackles for loss and five sacks. But again, it's a team that ain't been great when we're, especially when we're talking about explosive plays. They, they have allowed, oh my goodness, they have allowed explosive plays against every team that they have faced this season, uh, twenty yards or more. And that also means that the Husky defense, at least in total yards, ranked one hundred thirty, one hundred twenty third out of one hundred thirty one FBS teams. Again, it ain't it ain't great. And if you let Quinn Ewers and that offense get to rolling. I don't know. You might have to force a shootout or Michael Penix Jr. might have to force a shootout. So get to winning time. That's the last key for Washington on this front. Get into the final four minutes, five minutes of the game with a shot to win it or with the lead. Because if you get into winning time, you have shown as Washington Huskies this year and last year, you will win that football game. As a matter of fact, it's not just the winning 20 straight. It's how they have won it. They run it, run, run in the ball. They won it without Jalen McMillan. They run it out throwing people. They They won games that everybody expected them to lose. Washington, in Seattle, Washington, playing Oregon in the Pac-12 championship game. Like, I just, we didn't expect Washington to be that team that is finding ways to win late. I think Washington is what we expect Texas Christian to be last year, honestly. It's just, it's a much better undefeated program and one that we all trust so much so that they're the number two team in the country. So you can't hold back. You have to gut the house. That means throwing the kitchen sink at people. And you got to make like, you got to finish this by God iterod for the Washington Huskies in 2023. Like, I like to think of the Huskies as pulling iron will on their way to Nome, Alaska. You, you're in the last stage. This is it. All right. You got a full belly. You're rested. It's 22 miles to the end. Angus McTeague be damned. Finish the damn race. All right. This is going to be a lot of fun if y'all can do this. I don't think anybody is going to be mad at Washington making a college football playoff national championship. And as an Oklahoma fan, I'm not going to turn down nothing but this turtleneck. You know how mad I'd be to see Texas win a national championship college football playoff there for Oklahoma? Given Oklahoma been there, you know what? I could get into a position where I start blowing out the mic again, and that's not what we want. So I'm just going going to tamp it back down before I start talking about Texas beating Oklahoma to a national championship college football playoff. So like I've been saying, winning time is Husky time, but I'm still going to pick Texas. This is the analyst in me. This is the dude that's watching ball, watching all the college football. that's, That's my job description. Watch as much college football as there is to watch and be knowledgeable about what you see. And unbiased when we're coming to take, making picks on what you see. I see Texas being a much more sound defense. They're legitimately good. Texas defense, like Texas offensively is what they have been. Talented, capable, right? So is the Washington offense. But if we're talking about stopping people from scoring, Texas is in a better better position to do that than Washington, unless Washington can play above its level. I just don't see that happening. So, I mean, 
I guess this means that I'm expecting to see a September rematch in the college football playoff national championship game between Alabama and Texas, in which case, I think y'all know which one I'm going to pick there. If you like what you've seen, consider subscribing to the number one college football show on YouTube, the Fox Sports app, or wherever you get your podcast.